The art of fursuit making is a staple amongst furry culture. Thus, the small businesses responsible for crafting these suits hold a large proportion of popularity and respect. Once upon a time a few years back, Don't Hug Cacti was a prominent figure in this field, being founded by the couple Scuff and Lucky Coyote. As time has progressed, these names have fallen out of favour. Names in the wind only spoken when one of these suits appears at a meetup or convention. Newer furries or those who may keep separate from drama may be unknowledgeable on why this is. What happened to these creators, or more accurately, what did they do? The story comes with a track record of crimes, building a resume of controversy that fails to fully deter the founders from leaving the fandom. On the 25th of September 2020, artist Qtins would tweet a link to a Google document containing nearly 100 pages of mostly testimonials, alleging everything between animal neglect, zoo tendencies, and emotional manipulation of minors. Going through all examples within the pages of this document would mean this video wouldn't come out for another few months. Instead we're going to stick to a few key items and characteristics of the founders, and we acquire a good understanding of the overall content via the opening warning. A forewarning that this document contains brief, text-only descriptions of SA, grooming with a significant age difference, as well as inappropriate contact with minors, SA with animals, animal neglect, and instances of verbal and emotional attacks. This is not a pleasant document to compile and write, and it will not be a pleasant document to read, so please proceed with caution. I should note that from here on out I'm going to give a linear timeline of important events. Some information is contested by the founders and responses that will appear later in the video. Although first it's best to introduce those founders and how they made their start. Don't Hug Cacti began on April 23rd 2007, founded by Lucky Coyote who occasionally goes by their other alias Blonde Foxy. They would found their company with their boyfriend Scuff Coyote. The suits themselves were met with fandom wide praise, many enjoying the expressive cartoony style which both artists appear to have nearly mastered. Altogether, this accumulated in the brand being recognized as one of the most popular fursuiting companies in the fandom. We can see this by their appearances during several furry conventions at the time. Lucky and her suits were a great deal of envy to many. Lucky Coyote's design itself could be noted as striking. The yellows contrasting with the pink create a standout and recognizable pattern design. However, if we look back at artwork she drew of her character, there's a notable extra piece of design that should be accounted for, a paw tattoo placed on her hip. It's noted that this tattoo is an optional design, but its meaning is rather symbolic of something else. A calling card in identifying fellow zoos. I should note to make this fully clear, not all paw markings are referenced to this. Oftentimes, people will get tattoos to symbolize a dog that passed away, or any other number of reasons. Whereas, Lucky's tattoo is placed in a very specific spot. In zoo culture, this is to mimic where a dog may place their paws when sharing a intimate moment with a human. This design can be seen in various drawings, and you may notice that these markings aren't often consistent with the side of the hip they belong on, or the amount of paw tattoos. Sometimes they're on both hips, sometimes they're only on the left or right hip. Whilst this could just be changes in design, or even mistakes, it may be representative of the markings not being important to the design. Rather, they exist as a calling card with no other intent. Other than that, more artwork shows Lucky had a fondness of drawing German shepherds with varying levels of lewdness. That's evident by some of the captions. Quote, OMG, a p Yeah, okay. I'm gonna start uploading p Poor little German shepherd doesn't understand what he just did. Pro tip, this is my first upload. I am not a dog part expert. She would also mention having a lush for German Shepherds. They're so handsome she can't resist. Signed Lucky, the German Shepherd loving yoke. In more troubling news, Lucky owned a German Shepherd, both as a family dog in her youth and at the same time as these posts, meaning she owned a dog whilst making and discussing her lust for the exact same dog breed online. According to Raven Fox from the document, it was this family dog she had her first experience with. One other thing you're going to learn is Lucky was an extremely open person. Of the testimonials, many are just her confessing to some of her actions. She told one anonymous user she used to have acts with animals, and showing appreciation to zoo artists for their more realistic interpretations of dog parts. Another would say she quote, at least liked the idea of acts with animals, and attended zoo meets at conventions. What occurred at those meets, I do not know. Personally speaking, do I think Lucky is a zoo? I have my doubts and I cannot say with full certainty. Much of this information is speculative. However, what's evident is Lucky partook in several cases of zoo tendencies in posts regarding animals. 
Lucky was also accused to mistreat her animals unrelated to sexual pleasure. The document demonstrates a clear and concerning pattern of Lucky rehoming or abandoning her animals. In 2007, Lucky would adopt Sparta. And apparently this is a thing. Maybe it's my New Zealand isolation or my lack of understanding of American culture. But the reason the cat appears blue in the picture is because Lucky dyed him by putting Kool-Aid in his bath water a few days previous. Now, I don't know this was a method people used. The WikiHow article makes it look like this man is just contemplating existence. Anyway, that's unimportant. Two years later, Lucky would post that she adopted out Sparta to another home. Later that same year, she would adopt another animal, this time a very cute Pomeranian. Although, only after a week, she would then surrender the dog to the vet due to neurological problems. A post from the time show Lucky expressing her sadness from this event and anger towards the seller, who gave her the dog under shady conditions. According to Lucky, the dog tested positive for a parasite ingested from dirty water, leading to the seller having their licenses sell revoked. She then ended her post by saying she and Scuff were attempting to find another dog in its place. Scuff would then purchase a shelter dog named Pepsi. This dog and her German Shepherd would be the only dogs to stay in her long-term care. Scuff would then surprise Lucky again with another Pomeranian, Rufio. Very, very cute face. He lasted for a year. Those stories only accounted for the dogs. Lucky housed a variety of other animals. Take rabbits for example. Now if I know anything about rabbits, they indulge in sarcasm and retweet werewolf art on Twitter. Lucky didn't give her rabbits this privilege, for better or for worse. Instead, Lucky lets her rabbits roam and reproduce as they please. Allowing this to happen made her little rabbit population grow. What started as a few rabbits grew to four, then upwards of 10 to 15. This growing population was impossible to contain in cages, meaning the fencing of the property was their whole boundary. Rabbits are known not just for their reproductive tendencies, but their insistent burrowing leading to many of the rabbits escaping and being preyed on by hawks, owls, or ironically, coyotes. Sadly, not all of this breeding was accidental. Lucky reportedly would section off specific breeds she was fond of. Once they had mated and produced their desired babies, the adults were boxed, driven elsewhere, and released into the world. This malicious act of animal abandonment was done to the pets she believed had served their purpose. Thankfully, the rabbits are not in her care anymore. The special ones that survived went on to be rehomed. Furthermore, Lucky also owned multiple birds. She brought a blue and gold macaw named Venus, which after around four to five months would be under her care. Lucky grew tired of caring for the birds, so chose to rehome them, which keep in mind is quite psychologically damaging for the parrot. She would also take care of a one-winged lovebird she aptly named Uno after the number of wings it had. When Lucky stopped posting pictures of this bird, her first excuse was it quote, left, implying that the bird just ran or flew away. <laughs> However, in this case, I need to reiterate, one-winged bird. The bird had one wing. It's purely speculatory what happened. Worst case scenario, it was similar to her darling rabbits or from one of her dogs. Aside from animal recklessness, Lucky would also hurt her animals in a number of ways. One anonymous testimonial claimed when one of her rabbits became blout, she would physically crush it rather than have it put down humanely. Other testimonials echo these statements and add further context, and I still left out some other stories. That should emphasize the amount of animals that went through the hands of Lucky and didn't make it out the other side. Animals weren't the only thing Lucky couldn't keep her hands off of. There are a few examples of interactions she has had with minors. For starters, we have Lucky discussing her kinks inside an Instagram group chat containing two minors. Yes, Lucky was aware of their age, stating things like, when y'all 18 we can party, take y'all to Lucko land, or I know I'm much older but I'm glad I can connect with you guys. Two accounts from Raven Fox and Anonymous Bear would tell how Lucky was very open about sexual interests and fantasies. Chatting with minors on the topic, acting as a sort of desensitization towards the content. Talking about topics such as sex life, kinks, displaying her used toys, and teaching some of the minors how to release, for lack of a better word. From all that's known, Lucky never engaged with any physical advancements onto any minors. But the act of lewd chat rooms and fetish conversations with these minors shows a pattern of carelessness. With a lot of the kids attracted to the cartoony style of her fursuit making, it put Lucky in a prime example to abuse her power. I will also mention there is a portion on SA. I'm choosing not to go over the content due to its graphic nature and length. All these sources will be linked below and I encourage those who have the time to read more on the subject. Final piece of the document we're going to go over is how Lucky treated the people around her, more specifically those in the trans community. This section is compiled of a bunch of testimonials, all of which with the connecting theme of Lucky being incredibly disrespectful 
disrespectful towards the transgender community. She allegedly showed constant behavior of dead naming and purposeful misgendering, believing transgenders to just be confused, that they were yet to sort their hormones out or just get laid. Just a bunch of confused people in a phase. Lucky was allegedly unwilling to adapt to these people's preferred gender expression, and instead demean and belittle. Each of these testimonies corroborated these stories. They also mentioned Lucky's concerning use of the n-word, according to them blurting it out on occasion multiple times in a row. These come from completely testimonial examples without any sufficient evidence. However, I will address that loophole shortly. That just about sums up the important events contained within the documents. Again, the full document is a substantial 93 pages long. So what I've summarized merely details the surface level stuff with the stories I found the most interesting. However, we're yet to go over the responses. To act in order of appearance, don't hug cacti through their company Twitter, would publish tweets regarding the document towards Lucky. In these stressful times, please be respectful to the DHC customers and employees. We are a team of five full-time employees that create artists and costumes for people throughout the world. We have helped raise over $7,000 in donations for animal rescues with goals of doing much more. They would further go on to say that, Blonde Foxy or Lucky Coyote is not the owner of DHC. She has left social media several weeks ago and has been receiving treatment for social media addiction and other personal issues. While she was a part of her infancy and we are grateful for her artistic contributions. What we can see here in these tweets is both a deflection and lack of accountability. Using the mask of stress to deflect controversy, this can be seen as a way to minimize discussion of the document without actually doing anything to refute the claims. The closest actual mention to the document itself was just to say that Lucky was not the owner of DHC, which itself isn't completely accurate as her role would still be recognized as owner. Perhaps infuriatingly mentioned is the charity donations they've done, and possibly the least subtle way to virtue signal. This response certainly didn't favor the group any good, nor were the leaked messages a month later showing Scuff Coyote making orders to delete the post as he had left it up for a month, it's time to move on. The reason being in the previous message, DHE is fine though, suits are selling, employees are getting paid. It's this type of behavior that I find horrendous, but I'll approach that topic later in the video. A few months later DHC would post another lengthier response. This would happen on February the 5th, 2021. Our company has recently become the subject of online attacks after a few individuals had a personal dispute with one of our affiliates. These extreme, false allegations become more flagrant and embellished each time they are repeated on social media, and have escalated to harassment against our team members. We will not tolerate attacks against our employees, affiliates, or customers and will be seeking legal recourse. We are exploring our legal avenues to address these attacks. This legal action would take the form of a cease and desist lawsuit towards the original artist who posted the doc. Cutins, the original poster, would make a call to attempt to raise money for legal fees. The lawsuit itself wouldn't go through however. In reality, from DHC's perspective, it wouldn't do much but waste time and money. Outside the company, Lucky would respond to the drama in her own way, releasing a now deleted 25 minute long response video. I will leave a re-upload so you can view the video in its entirety if you wish. What it does is frame the creators of the document and its inclusions as malicious slander, claiming to be from people she knew and trusted for a long time who had broken her trust. She criticized Cutins, the artist who initially released the document, for mishandling the lawsuit and misrepresenting it. The story goes, according to Lucky, her lawyer sent a letter of retraction to Cutins, asking questions such as how could she make such specific and salacious allegations without meeting or purchasing from the company. To answer this, many of the allegations such as zoo tendencies require no personal knowledge of the company. Also, allegations which do require personal knowledge were not made by Cutins. They are testimonials written by whoever it's from. The letter would also frame the actions of Cutins as cancel culture and requesting to be kept to discussion as to not further legal enforcement. However, despite specifically asking Cutins not to post on social media, this is exactly what Cutins did. No matter how Lucky wants to portray this, Cutins is completely within their right to do such. If they choose to go public with this information, they are allowed to do that. There is not much to criticize when people call out for support. Next, Lucky went through various testimonials from the document attempting to dismiss them as false. When it comes to many of the testimonials, I cannot say who is telling the truth here. However, the amount of testimonials severely outweigh Lucky and her partner, although she attempts to deny them anyway, such as Anonymous Fox's accusation of SA, alongside Raccoon's corroboration of the same statement. Another statement she specifically noted as false was Nico's. Lucky directs attention at a particular part of the writing from Nico about grooming and manipulation. She states that this could not be in the realm of reality as they were 100% platonic. 
Nico even claims to have been groomed. How can this be in the realm of reality when we had a 100% platonic friendship and they repeatedly mention how independent I encourage them to be throughout our friendship? These two things cannot exist at the same time. As we can see from the quotes Lucky pulls up, the part where Nico talks about independence is in relation to their parents. I also vented about my parents a lot to her whilst I was a teenager slash young adult living at home. Because yes, I would often get frustrated with them, which is normal. Lucky would also push me to become more independent from my parents, which isn't a bad thing, but was always quick to remind me how she cut her parents off at any time I complained about mine, as if encouraging me to do the same. Lucky's encouragement didn't encourage Nico being independent from her, no, rather used to attract them closer. This independence was about stepping away from what could be the safety of their parents. Bringing this portion up doesn't show that you wanted them to be more dependent from you, rather the opposite. The other portion is a similar story, relating to moving into art school and away from their parents. However, that sentence was just completely cut off in the video. The rest of the video is almost completely dedicated to false reviews and previous false statements on her brand. However, it doesn't address a large majority of the document. She also ends the video by giving two stories about how she had felt unsafe at conventions. People harassing her and shouting expletives or accounts made to harass her. Now this goes without saying, but I do feel tremendously sorry for these events. No matter who it is, these acts are disgraceful and should never be encouraged. Whilst I praise the courage to talk about them and be open about depression, one can easily see how it could be used to deflect drama. It could easily be seen how this focus forgets everything else in place for her own feelings. Finally, in another attempt to question the validity of the document, arguments made either in favour of Don't Hug Cacti or by the founders themselves can be seen in a YouTube video going over the document. The interview in question features YouTuber Shiokami, along with a friend known as the Brony Inspector, who interviews both Lucky and Scuff whilst reading through the document. Shiokami is an individual who prior to this interview has published a video in criticism of the document. She stated her dissatisfaction with the lack of sufficient evidence, particularly to back up many of the user testimonies. The video would be met with backlash as demonstrated within the comment section. Angry commenters would write that she was taking her side, impartial and very antagonistic towards possible victims, and calling out she on certain topics. The video itself takes a lot of focus on aspects or stories from the document that have little to no sufficient evidence besides hearsay. From this, she insinuates that the contents must be untrue or likely false. This is despite the overwhelming amount of stories. And personally, when acknowledging other contexts of Lucky's use of the n-word, the zoo tendencies, etc, it's not entirely implausible for the transphobia to be real as well. Yes, it is very true that some of the testimonials could be based on misconceptions, or at worst, lies. But only highlighting the few that have the possibility of being so could be seen as unintentional bias. When she does mention those screenshots, there is a tone of dismissal. For example, Lucky's kink conversations to a group chat for minors I showed earlier. She calls the act very irresponsible, which is to say a sly understatement. She also says that the poor markings don't inherently mean a zoo calling card, using other examples of pattern designs and trends on personas. However, no one is calling the use of striped socks a zoo calling card that is unrelated to the poor designs, as the specific placement holds a distinct meaning from the other forms of character design. Whilst I will agree that the document in many ways should be questioned, it's ignorant to dismiss entirely or ignore Lucky's lacking response. Back to the interview, throughout its runtime of 3 hours they go over each individual story, be it small and insignificant or otherwise. The common theme being aspects of each story were true but were filled with holes. As a quick minor example in Anonymous Bear's testimony, Lucky admits she did take LSD. This as a result caused her to urinate. However, Lucky states that this was in the bushes and away from the tent like Bear claimed. She herself later calls back to this conversation, directly saying, we went over that so we don't need to talk about that again. We've come to the conclusion that the urinating in the tent was false. Based off of what? You can't have it both ways, where you criticise people for jumping to conclusions and then you do the same for the opposite side. Especially when one side is based on a massive amounts of testimonies and Lucky's known bad habits, and the other is a hazy remembrance from someone who was literally on LSD. Escalating this further when Bea talks about the video calls between the two, quote, She offered to teach me how to eject. 
I said I'm good, but she followed up with some tips even though I didn't ask. Another instance was when she was cleaning her toys she had just used because they were still wet during our video call and wanted to show me. Lucky says that she never offered demo ejection tutorials, and that the toys weren't wet from her use. They were wet because they had just been cleaned. But you still showed them the toy? If what Lucky said was true that the toy was wet from cleaning, Bia may have inferred differently for an understandable reason. However, this doesn't deflect from the fact that you showed a toy to someone who claimed to be around the age of 15. Lucky says they thought Bia was 18, which doesn't make sense to me as it was a video call. You would have clearly seen them. I understand that there are some adult looking teenagers, but excuse me for finding that a little hard to believe. If this conversation happened in 2016 or later when Bia turned 18, you could probably fact check that information. In response to the transphobia allegations, Lucky seems a lot more genuine. She says that in her past she has had some views that have changed over time. That is understandable. Many regret their past and have grown as people. I found it annoying that Lucky never apologized for what she did, and instead chose to blame those like Nico for never voicing their concerns at the time. However, it seems that Lucky has evolved since then, so while she has said some vile stuff, I'm glad that she hasn't continued. When addressing the zoo tendencies, Lucky claims that the calling card was a mistake. She was unaware and would take away the design once called out. This is a reasonable response. Is it convenient? Yes, but it could very much be plausible. However, with the addition of feral art, her love for feral German shepherds, owning a German shepherd herself, all of the testimonies claiming similar stories, alongside the marking on her hips, it's extremely circumstantial that none of this is correlated in any sense. My personal perspective on the matter lies with many of the commenters on the video. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It's almost always the case that stories become exaggerated upon explanation, much as the case for the original document. Many of the stories will be taken to the extreme, to where the information is ever so slightly skewed. However, this does not discredit all of the contents. I wish there was more from both parties to prevent all of the speculation. People on both sides have made mistakes and have indeed jumped to conclusions on certain subjects. However, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Criticizing people against Lucky for believing everything without sufficient evidence isn't valid when you do the same in Lucky's defense. I've left arguments and videos on both sides for your viewing in the description. I hope that you can make your own educated opinion. At the end of the interview, Scuff reads out a few emails sent privately in support of Lucky. They use this to frame the document and everything against Lucky as a mob of cancel cult. People were just too scared to show public support and fear of societal disapproval. They also used the emails to demonstrate the amount of supporters they still have. People were just really pouring their hearts out to Lucky in these emails. People still support her and care for her. Look at all these emails of people thinking that the document is full of lies. Although this is irrelevant to any form of guilt. Think to the extreme of Kira the Wolf. How many supporters he still has. In reality, you could be the worst person on earth and there will still be people to support you. And for Lucky, this happened both publicly and privately. People still purchase the suits and support Lucky. Don't Hug Cacti still continued as a business running commissions and presumably making profits. As Scuff said in those leaked DMs, suits are selling, employees are getting paid. I take extreme issue with this. The lack of proper accountability to then ignore everything entirely and continue like nothing happened. It's a disgusting business strategy that unfortunately works. This drama appears every now and again when we see another furry purchase a new suit. The internet flares up to spread the story, but to DHC, it doesn't matter. They could still continue without much consequence. We could sit here and debate which parts of the document are valid, which parts are over exaggerated, or even which parts are false. I have my own opinions on what's happened. I understand my position as a creator, that I cannot base my conclusions in my videos on assumptions, so I encourage you all to form your own view on the story's legitimacy. But that doesn't draw away from the fact DHC would rather brag about their charitable donations, complain about worker harassment, and make profits rather than take the proper accountability. This isn't just a weekly drama where something happens and you move on. It's extremely integral that these accusations are addressed formally with the proper receipts. What we're left with is newer furries, entering the fandom unbeknownst of DHC's rich history. Confused on why a new suitor starts generating hate. We also have a fair deal of DHC defenders, who as you can see are slightly stripped of talking points. I hope this video gives you a larger understanding on the matter. I hate leaving so many open-ended questions, especially with validity on the most important contents. 
However, you are within your own ability to gauge your opinion. And if this video tells you anything, it's to spend your money on a different company. I assure you the price DHC is worth is far better spent elsewhere. If you're unsure on what other companies there are, Maybe since DHC was so popular you've had little exposure to other varieties. There are tons, and I mean tons of incredible fursuit makers, and videos on YouTube that promote these makers. So with that being said, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Make sure to join my Discord server down below, follow my Instagram and my Twitter, and I guess follow me on Fred's too since that's a thing now. But anyways, I'll see you losers next time, peace.